Um, once again, welcome everybody and good afternoon. Uh, my name is Jagadish Shakti Vashrinikis. I use the pronouns. And as Andrew said, I'm the associate director. Uh, first, thank you, Andrew, and the other members of the admin team for setting up everything today in, here uh, on site. So we're happy to have you here this afternoon. And uh, we want to uh, start off by just telling you a little bit about ISCHEM, and then I'll turn it over to Dr. Michael Lupo, who will be our moderator for this uh, afternoon's talk. So ISCHEM was founded in 2015, and it's the first university-wide institute in the country focusing exclusively on the health and well-being um, and conducting research around issues related to uh, LG, I'm sorry, uh, sexual gender minorities and gay and communities. We're also the largest institute in the world researching LGBT health and well-being. As a university-wide institute here at Northwestern, uh, our mission is to connect scholars from numerous disciplines with the SGM community and to forge collaborations and stimulate innovative research to improve SGM health and well-being. We provide opportunities for high-level research and training for the next generation of scholars, some of whom you'll hear from today, and disseminate information to the SGM community and public um, and the public, scholars, policymakers, educators, and service providers. Our current issues in LGBTQ health lecture series focuses on highlighting uh, important work being done in the field of LGBTQ health, such as today's talk featuring three of our current postdoctoral research scholars. And now it is my pleasure to turn it over to Dr. Michael Weaver. Thank you, Andrew. My name is Michael Newcomb. I uh, use he him pronouns, and I'm an associate professor um, with ISGEM in the Department of Medical Social Sciences. And the reason that I am moderating uh, the um, panel today is because I also direct our postdoctoral training program at ISGEM, which is funded by a T32 grant uh, from the National Institute of Mental Health. Um, so what we're going to do today is we have three of our postdocs presenting on their research. Um, we're going to go in alphabetical order, and I'll introduce each person uh, before they speak. We'll save all questions for uh, the end um, when everybody's done with their three presentations, um, and then we'll have some open discussion both in the room and um, online. Um, someone will be monitoring the chat, maybe me. I don't know who that is, but I'll figure it out between now and the end. <laughs> got it. Yeah. Okay, got it. Thank you. Um, so our first presenter today will be um, online via Zoom, um, and that is Dr. Michael <laughs> Curtis. Um, Dr. Curtis is a postdoctoral research fellow at ISGEM. He received his PhD in human development and family studies with an emphasis in marriage and family therapy at the University of Georgia. His research focuses on investigating the stress processes linking intersectional traumatic stress to Black American sexual minority men's increased risk of HIV exposure, <coughs> excuse me, substance use, and mental health problems. He's particularly interested in the protective effects of romantic relationships during emerging adulthood on these processes, as it is a largely understudied yet highly important context within which health inequities can be perpetuated, exacerbated, or mitigated. At ISGEM, he works primarily on the YRBF pro project. Um, so, Michael, you can uh, share your screen and take it away. Ah, thank you. Oh, let's do the share screen. Ah, here we go. Hi, everyone. So um, today I'll be talking about um, some of my research, particularly related to intersectional stigma and its effects on Black sexual minority men, and talking about some of the challenges and current opportunities within the literature. So I always like to start off all presentations with an overview of me and who I am. So in addition to being sort of a critical scholar, I think it's important for you to have an understanding of sort of my positionality and how I approach my research to really understand how important it is to me and also the biases and lenses through which I approach my studies. So I am a um, Black queer style scholar, uh, originally from California. Um, uh, I currently live in Atlanta, Georgia. Um, so all of these things sort of converge to influence how I see my scholarship. Um, all of my research is really informed by critical lenses such as intersectionality, critical race theory, socioecological models of um, health and well-being. Um, and all of that sort of converges 
on my research interests. So my primary research interest sits at this like center of Black men's holistic health, particularly outcomes related to HIV and PrEP use and substance use, on um, gender and sexual minorities holistic health, um, particularly related to mental health care um, and well-being, uh, traumatic stress studies, and stigma studies. So this, what we know about sexual minority men's health um, is that while they have higher levels of educational attainment um, in comparison to um, Black straight men and even uh, Black sexual minority women, they're more likely to live in urban areas alone and unpartnered. Um, there's the second most likely to live below the poverty line, the first being uh, right after Black LGBT women, and twice as likely to report having diagnosis, being diagnosed with depression. Um, and one of the biggest things that I think most people talk about, um, they're at the greatest risk of HIV acquisition, as well as sort of discontinuing along the PrEP HIV continuum. So we have all of these quote unquote negative health disparities that we're seeing within this community. However, Black men's health is often seen in this sort of unidimensional lens of depression or anxiety or HIV without seeing their holistic lived experiences. And so my research really focuses on challenging those perspectives and offering counter narratives to what may be going on and what may be perpetuating a lot of these disparities. In particular, recently, I've been focusing on how multi-level intersectional stigma influences these processes. So I won't, I don't think I need to give this room a definition of stigma, um, but it operates across various socio ecological levels. So on the interpersonal uh, level, you can, we have things like enacted stigma, so manifested behaviors. These are things that uh, we normally talk about as sort of discriminatory acts. So being fired or being aggressed upon because of some aspect of your identity. Um, here is sort of where intersectionality comes in a bit because we often talk about uh, stigma in relation to one access. So like racism or sexism. Um, but really for the vast majority of people who are not in the ultra privileged area, um, it is a conglomerate of different power uh, processes of power, privilege, and oppression that change and fluctuate depending on the context within which we're looking at. So thinking about, I'll use myself as an example, as a Black queer man, my Blackness and my queerness is more evident in a room of white straight people than it would be in a room of Black straight people where my queerness may be um, the thing that stands out the most or puts me apart the most that, that I may receive stigma about. My maleness in, in a group full of cis women may, be, may stand out more than it would in a mixed uh, gender group or an all male group. All of these things sort of converge and, and are important for us understanding health disparities, particularly because we notice that stigma is a major driver of these disparities. Um, these drivers happen within and across different sort of socio-ecological -eco uh, levels. Um, on, I was talking about sort of macro system, but when we're looking about the community system and community isolation, stigma processes, as highlighted in the figure here, can cause sort of social isolationism um, that can affect mental health care. It also can affect access to sort of structural resources. So one of the things that I'm kind of learning with some of the, the qualitative data that I'm processing right now is people often rely upon social capital resources like family members, friends, um, to get access to healthcare, to be able to make doctor's appointments, especially when we are, especially when they're struggling with sort of socioeconomical barriers, which we know is also highly prevalent in the Black American community. If you're a person living with HIV and the only way you can get your healthcare is if your best friend gives you a ride, when you don't have a best friend or you or your best friend falls out, you may, we see a, we may see a sort of disconnection. And so my research really focuses on, um, talking about these complexities, unpacking a bit of these complexities to hopefully translate them into um, 
interventions um, that we can roll out both on the individual um, as well as the community and, and hopefully structural levels. So a, a multi-level approach. So one of the studies I'll be talking about today um, looks at some of the concepts that I just brought up a moment ago and how multidimensional intersectional stigma um, is associated with substance misuse among young Black uh, gay, bisexual, and men who have sex with men. So as I talked about a moment ago, um, we know that men who... Uh, Men living with HIV are, well, young, Black, gay, um, bisexual men, and men who have sex with men um, are disproportionately more likely to have HIV and to live, be living with HIV. Um, however, they're also disproportionately like, more likely to have some form of sort of discontinuity across the, the spectrum. Um, and one of the, the centralized drivers of that um, is substance use. We see that a lot sort of in literature talking about how um, the use of substances like alcohol and particularly opioids and meth use recently uh, here in Atlanta um, really have complicated people's access to the HIV continuum. And so I was really interested in um, the association between these two concepts and how was one's experiences of stigma um, related to substance misuse for people living with HIV. Um, and I was really interested in differing types of, of stigma um, outside of the normative frameworks that we'll see, or the typical frameworks that we'll see, racism, heterosexism, those sorts of things. So I was actually interested in two distinctive forms of stigma, and if they were interrelated with one another, and if they produced are related to substance misuse. And that was HIV stigma and mental health stigma. So did people uh, feel or experience discrimination related to the HIV status or living with HIV? Um, and, or um, did they endorse sort of negative views about mental health and mental health care treatment? And I was wondering if, um, these two things also converged, um, like we see other typical models that are looking at um, racial discrimination, gender, and even maybe even sexual identity, um, and how those were related to substance misuse. So that looks like this. <laughs> My initial hypothesis was that um, HIV um, stigma and uh, mental health care stigma would be so related to one another that they would be they would produce sort of this latent multi-dimensional stigma latent variable and that would directly produce or be related to substance misuse i also had a hypothesis that traumatic stress would mediate this association um it's a less it's a growing sort of notion or or theoretical framework uh, within stigma studies that experiences of stigma um, can be so profoundly psychologically distressing that they produce a rise to clinically significant levels, i.e. traumatic stress. So an example of that may look like um, because of my discrimination at work, I'm really hypervigilant about my next working environment, or I have nightmares because potentially I'll be homeless. And so how one experience of um, stigma may, may produce these effects. Historic, this is a growing sort of theory and approach um, because historically traumatic stress studies have been guided by research on post-traumatic stress disorder, which I think most people are, are, are know what PTSD is. However, one of the limitations of that is PTSD requires um, three criterion, criterion A, B, and C. I won't go into them because they're not really important for this, um, but criterion A are life-threatening events, and you must have Witness or been exposed to a life threatening event. Unfortunately, experiences of stigma, while they are life altering, um, are often not life threatening, but we know that they're major stressors. So, this hypothesis was tested using data from the Open Mind Study. It is a sample of 200 um, young Black gay men, uh, gay bisexual men who have sex with men uh, here in Atlanta. Um, 
And the original study was looking at mental health service utilization. And so my analysis was sort of a secondary analysis based on what was it collected from the data set. Um, I used validated measures of HIV stigma, mental health stigma, um, PTSD. So I used the PTSD checklist, which is one of the more popular ones. Um, and then um, the assist um, to measure sort of substance misuse. Covariates included in the model that I'll be showing um, included childhood adversity, which was the normative ACE scale, um, age, education, and annual income. Um, data analysis was used, uh, was I use structural equation modeling uh, to conduct my data analysis with a thousand bootstraps so I would have non-biased 95% um, confidence intervals. So the uh, standard mediation model looked like this. Interestingly enough, H mental health stigma and um, HIV stigma were highly associated with one another and fit well in sort of this multidimensional um, latent variable. There were also was a uh, full mediation wherein um, multidimensional stigma wasn't directly associated with substance misuse, but it was indirectly associated with substance misuse via traumatic stress. So as I talked about before, experiences of stigma produces significant clinically significant levels of stress, and that infects sort of people's substances. Um, the typical hypothesis for this association is that people use substances to cope with sort of the psychological distress. Um, some of the, the major sort of takeaways or discussion points um, from this study First, it talks about sort of the multidimensional nature of stigma, um, intersectional stigma, in that we have to look outside of just the, our typical frameworks of looking at the effects of stigma. It's more than just racial discrimination. It's more than just sexism. It's more than just um, heteronormativity. Um, it's all of these other accesses of stigma that also may be impacting people's health and well-being. Um, and we have to consider moving forward as we are designing and developing interventions, taking this sort of multidimensional holistic approach um, that looks at various aspects of people's lives. Um, one study that I dream of doing is looking at how classism um, affects people's engagement in the PrEP HIV continuum and substance use treatment. Um, some limitations of this study, uh, it was non-probability because it was cross-sexual sampling. Um, it was all self-reported measures. And the intersectional stigma measurement model only included two indicators. Um, they were unique indicators, so I think it's a unique contribution, um, but it didn't measure the, the standard things of like racism, heterosexism, um, and, and sexism. Um, if these measures were include, included in, in the latent variable, I feel as though I probably would have seen a direct effect and not a full, um, full mediation, but a partial mediation, um, because there's more robust literature having um, direct association between racism and substance misuse and those sorts of things. Um, but I don't think the results would change all that much except for that direct effect. So some major takeaways from the literature that's out right now about Black sexual minorities' health and some challenges of doing these sort of intersectional um, analyses and studies, um, they often get critiqued for not being uh, generalizable and being too niche. Um, and I, my response to that is, so what? Um, I think it's important that we do research on um, communities that are highly marginalized and who are in the most need. Doesn't matter how small they are. <laughs> I think it's important that we have and we build robust resources um, for every community. And I just happen to be focusing on the ones that I'm a part of. Um, there's also been a lack of consensus around how to measure intersectional stigma and particularly how to measure it across, across different levels. Um, I produced sort of a, a, a more novel approach to it in this study, um, but there are different ways of doing it. And, and all of these sort of intersectional scholars would be up to agree on what is the sort of gold standard of doing that. Um, and then lastly, there's like a lack of understanding surrounding the mechanisms linking intersectional stigma to health. So I produced or I, I posit that trans, um, that transactional sex is a major, not transactional sex, sorry. 
thinking of my example I was going to use, uh, traumatic stress as a major linkage, um, but there could be other things. Um, transactional sex is, is one example, um, as multi-level intersectional stigma often leads to socioeconomic instability, and so people may turn to survival and transactional sex to survive. Um, some major opportunities um, for future research and growth. Um, I think there the Black sexual minority men's population is growing within the United States. We have an estimate of that it's about 400,000 men, um, but that is an estimate that is kind of unverifiable. I would argue it's probably a lot larger um, as people are, as Black the Black community in particular, being more open about disclosing um, and being engaged in community. Um, there's also a huge need for prevalent, uh, prevention and resilience-focused literature. Um, even the study I did today focused on detrimental outcomes and processes. Uh, we know very little about how do we build resilience against stigma. We know men, you know, any sort of marginalized group is going to experience it, how we can help them cope and navigate that, uh, navigate those experiences we know very little about. Um, and then lastly, the need to develop sort of multi-level interventions that support men in particular in this context, processing prior experiences of stigma and then building a uh, resilience for future account, uh, future encounters, which would be related to that whole need for sort of prevention resilience literature. So thank you for coming uh, to my talk. Uh, I hope I didn't ramble for too long or take up too much time. Um, yeah, I guess I'll take questions at the end. So thank you. Thank you very much, Michael. And uh, yes, we will hold all questions uh, until um, all three presenters have presented. So our next presenter is Dr. Jacob Gordon, um, who is a postdoctoral fellow at ISGEM. Uh, Jacob's research focuses on the use of technology, online applications like social media and dating apps, and the mental health outcomes of LGBTQ individuals that use these various forms of technologies. His current work at ISGEM will focus on the implementation of digital mental health interventions using human-centered design methodologies in collaboration with Dr. Catherine McCapital. Prior to joining ISGEM, Jacob completed his doctorate in social work at the University of Pittsburgh. Hey everyone, one second. All right. Um, so my name is Jake Gordon, or Jacob Gordon. Um, I'm a teacher to postdoc here. And I'm going to share today a brief background on how I ended up here and share some findings on my dissertations and how it all fits in about my time here at Ishim. So my educational and occupational background all lies with social work. Um, I always had a passion for more of the macro route of social work, so I never was a clinical practicing um, social worker. I always engaged in policy, uh, program evaluation, and just in general research. Um, so it all started in New Mexico. Um, I worked with NM Power, which is a Planned Parenthood like subsidy. Um, so it's like funded by Planned Parenthood. It's a queer, uh, it's a nonprofit for queer and not uh, questioning teens in the Albuquerque region. Um, and the, so this is where my passion for like, particularly the LGBT community, you know, was really beginning. I came out in Mount Kirky, so it was a really special place for me. Um, and it's also why I would later pursue a master's in social work. Um, so to that point, so in St. Louis, I worked with Promo, which is a little, little picture there. Um, it's an advocacy nonprofit, so they fought for non-discrimination policy for queer folks in Missouri. Um, so we were working on um, non-discrimination in just the workplace for queer folks and trying to get that passed at the state level. So I, work, I helped them as a research assistant to work on their surveys. Um, I also helped them have, uh, with advocacy and I also uh, lobbied at the state capitol, which is really fun. And in Pittsburgh, I worked with A3 Pittsburgh, um, organization that kind of 
was an introduction to like more of the sexual health realm of queer research. Um, I helped them with an, um, a prep awareness campaign in the Allegheny County region. So I've always had a very consistent theme of loving research, working with queer groups, and it's kind of how it all connects to policy, these more macro level um, routes. But I must admit, I never expected to really study what I do now. Um, when I first started my PhD program, I was mainly interested in PrEP use and mental health use, or mental health uh, outcomes of LGBT folk. Uh, but now my main area of interest is, oops, here's one, dating apps. Uh, so about one year into my PhD program, I just kind of happened into a really good mentor who uh, studied technology use among queer folks. And I never really looked back, it sort of clicked and it combined a lot of passions of kind of a new emerging field, my love of technology. And yeah. So at the time in 2018, when I first started researching this, um, there was not much research in dating app use among queer folks. And most research was framed in very stigmatizing ways. So for example, studies that examine dating app use often looked at its correlation with HIV, you know, its correlation with like, oh, people that use dating apps are more likely to have more sexual partners. So there's always this deficit framing in this dating app world. Um, and there were even fewer studies on mental health and dating app use. So it seemed like sexual health really took kind of the primary um, bulk of the research on dating app use. So this was um, exciting for me because I didn't, I was not interested in those things. I was really interested in more kind of individual level factors with dating app use. Um, so it was easy to kind of find my niche in this world. Um, yeah, so early literature definitely conceptualized dating apps as a risk factor for poor sexual mental health. Um, but they only examined a very narrow view of what dating app use really was. So for instance, dating app use was really kind of operationalized as like how much they use it, what is the frequency they use it, how many times do they log in a day, and how does that correlate with things like HIV and depression? Um, so it's a very narrow view of what this very broad topic of dating apps really were. Um, but when you actually talk to dating app users, they don't think of their use of just sexual health risks. You know, like if I if I walk up to someone like, hey, like how was your experience with dating apps? They're not thinking in terms of like, oh, I really exposed myself to STIs or something. It's they're sharing stories about their successful, you know, their success, their unsuccessful uh, meeting with friends. Um, sometimes they're sharing stories of harassment or discrimination or more of these individual level, um, micro level things, or perhaps even addictive use of dating apps. So there was a mismatch between what researchers were looking at and how LGBTQ folks viewed dating app use. So some of the questions I really was interested in uh, during my dissertation and my PhD program was how do we conceptualize dating app use? Um, is it a predictor for mental health or perhaps a facilitator for friendships, facilitator for quality sex, and maybe a facilitator for belongingness? And how are individuals' goals and motivations when they're using dating apps relate to mental health? Like whether they're attaining these goals or failing to attain them. And kind of last was how do we improve the design of dating apps or how do we educate a dating app user to minimize the harm while you know, maximizing the benefit of making use of dating apps? <laughs> All right, so I really wanted to explore the connection to mental health, whether it was a positive or negative one. Um, so probably not a surprising fact for the folks in the room, but you know, queer folks um, use dating apps at nearly twice the rate of heterosexual people or straight folks. Um, and this rate is even further increased for those between the ages of 18 and 40. So this is a pretty interesting fact. Queer people are using dating apps in a very novel way compared to the rest of the population. And there's something kind of going on here of like why have we co-opted this kind of virtual space compared to the rest of the population. Um, so it seems pretty important to examine its, its impact on mental health if a large, you know, high prevalence of folks are using them. And importantly, too, they use them for a lot of different reasons. Um, it's not just primarily sex. It's, you know, to find sexual partners. It's to find um, to date, to find friends, and just generally to connect to the LGBT community in places. Imagine you're living in like rural Arkansas, and there really is no, you know, in-person 
clear from the data, you can engage in that online. And it's also worth noting that these, all these reasons that people use dating apps are for pro-social reasons. Um, so they're using them ideally to gain feelings of belongingness. Um, yeah. But as we all kind of know, you know, with that said, most of us here know that the reality using dating apps is not all cheery and it's not all about, oh, look, I found friends and I feel like I belong to the queer community. Um, sometimes it's quite the opposite. Uh, I don't know why I left that logic, but here are some headlines of some articles from like, you know, 2018 to like 2021 um, about dating apps that really highlight these polarizing experiences that people have with them. Um, I think a good one at the top right, which is lesbian and gay and bisexual online daters report positive experiences, but also harassment. So there's this level of like clear benefits, but they're intertwined with these, you know, negative experiences. And as a researcher in this field, quotes like these are kind of what, you know, excite me and like get me inspired to research this. Um, Cause there's something really nuanced happening in this virtual space. Um, so my question in my early research career became, how can a queer individual get what they want out of using a dating app while avoiding the negative aspects? Of it? So for my dissertation, um, I tended to explore this question by first conceptualizing dating apps as a social tool that queer folks engage in to meet various goals. So on the left here is an integrated model of belongingness. Um, and on the right, I adapted it and tested it in my dissertation. And Essentially, the point, the focus I'll have you look at is for the competencies to belong, which is yeah, the equivalent there. Um, I operationalize that as there's levels of success when they use dating apps. So how you know confident were they get reaching their goals um, when it came to belongingness? Um, and for opportunities to belong was the frequency. So the more they use dating apps, the more opportunities they have to belong. So you can see that the belongingness models actually fit really well with um, dating app use. But in my perspective, to experience belongingness through the use of dating apps, you had to be confident. There had to be a level of like, I can use dating apps confidently and successfully to like reach my goals and like find belongingness. Um, so my question became, how does successfully or unsuccessfully meeting your goals in dating apps impact your depression symptomology and your sense of belongingness? Um, and I test this in my, or I should say, I collected the data from this dissertation. And unfortunately, I had a very competent sample. Everyone in my, that I collected either was essentially agreed that they met their goal of use. So I had to kind of throw that variable away. I was hoping people were like, oh, I was highly unsuccessful with using dating apps. Um, so either it was either a really you know, bad measurement error, um, or just I had a really competent sample. Um, either way, I couldn't address it fully for this dissertation, but I'm still exploring the question today. Um, but there was a lot of like interesting findings I had from the dissertation. So I'll just share with you briefly, higher amounts of dating app use was positively uh, correlated with higher levels of belongingness. So the more people use dating apps, the more reported levels of belongingness they had. Um, but there were a couple individual level traits that were playing a large role in both symptoms of depression and belongingness, which I'll get to later. But essentially, um, racial and ethnic, so if you were gay or, or sorry, if you were black or Hispanic in the sample, um, you reported worse outcomes. So there was something going on with these individual level traits for the race and ethnicity um, in the world of dating apps. Um, so some of the takeaways were uh, that clinicians and researchers should consider the nuanced ways that people use dating apps. Um, and not just kind of how much they use them. Uh, they should also really look at individual level factors like race and ethnicity. So if you know, you're a clinician or researcher, realize that people that are like not, you know, not white experience things like racialized sexual discrimination where they're discriminated based on their um, color of the skin. Um, and the fact that this also study found that dating apps were a potential source of belongingness. So that's Dating apps are not this conceptual tool of just, you know, not um, of like sexual risk or HIV risk, etc. Kind of what, what I'm doing when I time now, like how I'm advancing uh, my research. 
So I really want to spend the next few years exploring how queer folks use dating apps with a particular focus on how they um, reach their goals. And if I ever get the time or money, I think a worthwhile project is really looking at um, creating a dating app self-efficacy scale. Um, and as a qualitative researcher, I also find it interesting that there are those who use dating apps very successfully, whether it's finding friends or finding sexual partners, and they experience no negative side effects. Um, at the same time, there are those with problematic usage who struggle to use them effectively and report negative side effects. So there's really this kind of interesting uh, conundrum. Um, yeah, and then kind of a couple of things I'm working on here is I'm involved with Catherine's R0123, where I'm getting a lot of experience in uh, early intervention implementation. And I will stop there so anyone has a problem. Keep going. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you, Jay. And our final presenter today is Dr. Juan Pablo Zapata, who is a postdoctoral research fellow at ISGEM. Pablo received his doctorate in clinical psychology at Marquette University and completed his pre-doctoral internship at the University of Washington Medical School in Behavioral Medicine. Uh, Dr. Zapata conducts research focused on sexual health, mental health problems, and uh, traumatic stress responses among Latinx SGM populations with a strong interest in HIV and PTSD. He examines how cultural values, interpersonal support, and psychological mechanisms can serve as resiliency factors in mitigating negative health outcomes. His NIH-funded dissertation project investigated PrEP uptake and retention among Latinx men in a community-based sexual health clinic. Love having the last name of the team for like the benefits of getting to class. Click that stop. Yeah, just hit share. All right, there we go. So thank you again, Michael, for the introduction and to Andrew, who's outside now, for helping to coordinate this event today. So my presentation today will focus more on an overview of some of the research that I was involved in prior to joining ISTRAM, as well as my research interest for the remaining of my T32 project which will focus on implementation science to tailor HIV prevention for Latino men in US. So prior to joining ISTRAM, a little bit background. So uh, I completed my undergraduate degree at the University of South Florida in Tampa, then proceeded to complete my PhD at Marquette University. So not too far from here. And then at the University of Washington, something that's not quite captured here that I really enjoy and hearing Dr. Curtis speak about his research is how his own personal experiences influence his own research. And that spoke really highly to like the things that I do, being an immigrant from Colombia, being embedded within these communities, um, primarily also being a clinician at the University of Washington, where I was able to deliver services to monolingual Spanish speaking people who were living with HIV. It was utterly like always translating material, figuring out how to make CBT work with work within these populations. Um, so a lot of the things that I do is influenced a lot by my own personal experiences and those clinical training opportunities. All right, but much of my research to date has focused again on Latino disparities, primarily as it relates to HIV and the PrEP continuum of care. Um, some of the questions that have guided my research interest to date are the following. So what are the most effective techniques to improve the distribution of PrEP among Latino MSM? How do contextual factors influence implementation success or failures? And finally, how can multiple interventions be effectively packaged and delivered for PrEP among Latino MSM? Um, these questions during my graduate training led me to conduct a systematic literature review um, that we reviewed approximately 70 studies. And of those 70 studies, we were able to review 30 of them from the dates of 2010 to 2019, which looked at what's been done about PrEP related to Latinos in the US. We were then able to publish this figure um, 
couple, two years ago now, which thankfully I don't have to get into describing the framework since Curtis said that for us already. Um, but as you can see here, the literature identified specific barriers that relate to the individual, interpersonal, community, and structural levels. So at the individual level, we have things such as provider mistrust, lower socioeconomic status, PrEP acceptability, to more broader level barriers such as widespread stigmas and healthcare federal policies. Um, what was really interesting in doing this review is that we found very specific findings for Latinos at the interpersonal level, specifically related to family disapproval and just social support in general, um, which was above and beyond many of the other findings that we had, which you can check out in that reading, in that publication. Um, but in continuing with all of this research, um, this framework or this model kind of led to my dissertation defense or to my dissertation in general. And to now go through the entire defense again, because you won't have enough time. So this was a <laughs> convergent mixed methods parallel design, which had two studies. The first study involved community uh, involved a involved interviews with community stakeholders in a clinic in Milwaukee. This clinic worked with primarily Spanish-speaking individuals who lived in the Milwaukee area, but as well as rural neighborhoods that were close to the city. Um, and the second study worked with or collected data from individuals who were connected to this clinic. And we were interested in determining whether or not cultural factors such as acculturation, familism, fatalistic beliefs um, were at all related to um, their decision to use or to not use PrEP. Um, in the dissertation, we, inter we interpreted each of these studies or each of these different phases separately and then we integrated the findings. Um, for the presentation today, I wanted to present instead on two studies that we um, were fortunately able to get up for published. Um, and the first study, um, as we, as many of you all have experienced here, used Steeper to try to determine what are the barriers and facilitators for PrEP implementation for Latino MSM. Um, so we, here, I, this is like an outline uh, table of the one that's included in the paper. Um, but specific barriers that were identified by providers included things at the innovation characteristics, such as drug side effects and cost of the medication, um, additional barriers include visit length, laboratory, uh, laboratories required, and return visit frequency. For the outer setting, there were more specific findings relevant to the socio-political and, polit and policy issues affecting undocumented Latinos. So once again, demonstrating that there are contextual factors that really do reduce or increase um, people's access to PrEP. Um, this specific study, though, was much more interested, though, in identifying potential intervention um, strategies or ways that we can modify the things that we're doing now. Um, so we were able to kind of characterize some of those conversations into different categories. So finding here suggests that a multi-level culturally relevant implementation strategy is needed to not only address typical or traditional access to the medication, but also a strategy that helps Latinos navigate the many syndemic factors that impact engagements with care in general. So connecting them to social services, such as figuring out what does Phil mean? Um, will this prevent me from speaking additional things in the future? Um, and you would imagine that a lot of these different things were specific to at the time um, during our former president. Um, so talking about like specific implications for that. One quote that I think summarizes it really well in terms of ways that we could make adaptations is this one. So show how to discuss prep from various standpoints by using different people. Show a video or something in a church or conversations between a priest and the main character, like viewpoints from different characters, and it doesn't have to be all that, right? Like with prep, maybe the main character or mom learns about it through someone at church. And in that way, at least it's a little bit more engaging and relatable. We don't have material like that. And many of the interviews with providers really highlighted the fact that there's basically not much that they can pull from that incorporates the outer level things such as engaging with parents. Um, are there scripts available that we can use that we can then introduce to parents on how we can talk about PrEP, for instance? So this paper or so this subset really highlighted ways in which we can try to get there in the future. Um, given that we do have the materials already, they just haven't been adequately adapted or tailored for this specific population. Um, the second study that I wanted to briefly just discuss on focused more on those quantitative findings. So how do those social, cultural factors impact engagement along the PrEP cascade? 
as you can see here in the red circle, there was a very poor engagement in the adherence and use side. So only 16 participants reported adequate usage or within that range, while many more were in within the contemplation range. Um, specific findings showed that those who were more acculturated to the US customs were more likely to be motivated to move towards later stages of the prep cascade, whereas gender norms such as machismo prevented individuals from moving along the prep cascade. Interestingly, though, um, reporting fatalistic or family or attitudes related to families, that moved individuals a little bit across the prep cascade. So again, suggesting that there are ways to get creative. Many people address, address fatalistic attitudes and family as usually deficit-based. Um, and there are so many areas for potential interventions that can use these different resources or different approaches. So while at ISTRAM, um, part of the stuff that I've been able to do is kind of an extension of the work that I did previously. So um, with Brian and in his, in, in his SMART study, um, we were able to identify different ways that adolescents who took the survey in either Spanish or English um, responded to certain measures. So we found that Latino youth who completed surveys in Spanish were less likely than English language respondents to have accurate information of HIV testing and prevention behaviors. Um, but again, one of the other findings that we found was that Spanish-speaking participants were more likely to have conversations with their parents about HIV testing. So again, this all suggests that it's not not all bad, right? There is definitely areas that are not considered because they're usually seen from a deficit point of view. Um, so the other things that we're assessing um, within SMART will involve assessing perceived parental support, and this will be a mixed method investigation. And we're also conducting a systematic or scoping review of the determinants of PrEP implementation and strategies and assessment of populations. So where to come from all of that? I like to end with a picture of Mateo because it's just like, that's <laughs> cute. <laughs> a little bit of charm. Um, but open to questions now. They're up here now. Okay, cool. Um, all right, well, thank you so much, everyone, for your excellent presentation. Um, at this time, well, I know, but I would need to see the wonderful faces of everybody on the call, not just your wonderful dog. Um, but at this point, um, I'd like to open um, up to uh, questions, obviously, if the questions are specific to Michael, uh, he can unmute himself and answer the questions. Otherwise, if the two of you could, uh, you don't have to come up yet, but uh, you can walk out okay. uh, if questions are directed at you. So anyone in the audience or uh, on Zoom, uh, questions? Yes, Madison. I, uh, I have a method question for Michael. Um, so in your schematic of the, the model that you ran, I'm wondering if your factors were those principal components or were they latent factors? They were latent factors. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Other questions? Yes, Kyle. I actually had a question for Michael too. I think your, your point about why people choose to engage or not engage with sexual health care is a really interesting one. And I thought, your idea that you mentioned in passing about like doing a study about how classism affects people's decisions in those domains was really fascinating. And I would love to hear more just briefly about what you might envision that study looking like. I'm really actually interested in sort of pro, um, provider bias and how bias related to um, maybe how clients appear or show up in the room or their mannerisms or the ways in which they talk or dress impact how they um, interact with clients and client satisfaction. Um, and classism is one of those things that we always talk about and never really ever include um, in, in behavioral studies, but we know it's so important. Um, I talk about it a lot in my clinical practice because I often work with people who are at or below the poverty um, line in, in Atlanta and in, in rural parts of Georgia. And so I am ever present about 
my status as like a researcher, someone who is of a lot of privilege, um, socioeconomically and how that impacts how they perceive me um, and our building connection with one another within the space of therapy. Um, so yeah. Thank you. Thank mm -hmm. you so much. Um, yeah, Morgan. Uh, so I have a question for Jake on the mental health aspects of kind of these online dating houses. How do you then account for like this outer setting of physical space? Like when one is thinking about mental health on these applications, surely there's a sense of belonging when one's actually on the app. But considering many of these apps become facilitators for actual physical meetups that then can be further mediated in the outer setting by access to transportation, um, partner density, kind of the gamut of this, how do you account or the physicality of virtual spaces? Yeah, that's a great question. I, I don't think a lot of researchers really do account for that um, in dating app studies. It's either one, you know, they stick to one or the other. Like, oh, we're gonna look at partners um, that you've met using dating apps and that's it. And they stay away from the virtual space or the opposite where they're like, we're gonna talk about experiences you had online and not about you know, the partners you met in person. So I think we need to do a better job of realizing that it is on a continuum of like, you know, you use, you use a virtual space, use a dating app, but then you are existing in a physical space where you are enacting these things. Um, that's kind of a non-answer, but essentially that we need to do a better job of like incorporating the fact that it's a continuum. It's not just like offline, online. We continue our behaviors and our like moods between the two things. Um, yeah, that's our... I think the question was online. Oh yeah, uh, someone in the chat. Um, Susanna, our our wonderful program officer for the T thirty two has a question. So go ahead, Susanna. No, well, mostly it was just a comment about how amazing um, these three talks were, and um, just commend you three for putting together such um, such great talks and on such really interesting science. Um, and I think what really struck me was how nuanced you all are for being postdocs. You know, I think that you're really thinking about these issues in ways that aren't, you know, like, um, I, you know, I think like Jake mentioned around the dating app usage, it's not all good, it's not all bad, right? Like how do we sort of think about these things in much more nuanced ways um, to move the science forward? So I just saw that theme throughout all of those talks um, and just thought that was really, um, really wonderful to see. So great, thanks for inviting me. And yeah, really, really wonderful to hear, hear you all. Thank you so much, Susanna. I actually had a similar reaction in thinking about the three talks that there was. A common theme was that um, in the various different populations that were of focus, there were some specific risk factors identified, um, but also a number of ways in which those same experiences could be used as um, health promotive activities or could be viewed as resiliencies. And I'm wondering from all three of you, how um, you might think about your next research steps um, to apply some of these factors to understand resilience um, in the context of your work. Um, I don't know if someone wants to volunteer to answer that first. Uh, I can also just kind of fall on people. <laughs> well, you just volunteered yourself, Pablo, <laughs> so you get to go first. Well, thank you for the question. Um, I would think I would say that some of the ways that we've thought about this is what are some ways that we could begin to incorporate families in conversation? And I think one of the studies that I've always wanted to do is a focus group with different members of families like moms, dads, grandparents, uncles, aunts, et cetera, and just have a conversation about them on how they understand PrEP or HIV prevention in general, and using that information then to build exactly what we're trying to communicate and messaging techniques to try to maybe distill different uh, misconceptions on PrEP and also just to educate. Um, but I'd say that's one way that I thought about addressing this is including them in the research uh, within this since we tend to do focus groups only with like the individual or the health Excellent. 
Michael or Jake, any thoughts? Yeah, I know for me, the, the natural next evolution or next step in my research is going to be heavily resilience focused. Um, and I have a particular interest in interpersonal relationships um, and how building community um, can really be a sort of profound protective factor in the face of stigma. Um, and so that's sort of what the focus is, culminating to hopefully like a an intervention development project. Wonderful, thank you. Anything to add? Uh, I can quickly say that positive psychology related, so things like self-efficacy, using dating apps, and being able to like successfully attain goals are two things I think are really um, important, especially if your goals are like, it doesn't matter what your goal is. If it's sex, great, but how, how can we help you get there? And if it's like, I want to feel like I belong, how can we help you get there? So really be liberal with what goal is. It doesn't matter what goal it is, how can we help you get there? Great. Well, we have reached the end of our time. Thank you so much to all three of our presenters. Thank you so much to the organizers at ISGEM. And uh, we'll see you next time.